Okay, I think it's time. So I'm going to get started even as people are joining in. Are there any questions before we start? I mean, I, I did send you that email saying if you sent your DCF for feedback uh, on Thursday or later, you probably haven't got it back, partly because I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but I will try to get it back to you sometime this week. So you'll be ready to go. Um, <clears throat> And I'll also send you the template that I used to check your DCF. So that way you have a basis if you want to check your own DCFs. I mean, obviously you know, it's, it's, a, it's not, you, know, you, you don't want to use somebody else for the rest of your life. I'll send you the template that I use so you can design your own check. No. So today I want to talk more about pricing. We're into the pricing section. So might as well uh, start with the pre-class, with the start of the class test. So I'm going to start with some very basic questions about pricing, which reflect, I think, a lot of a lot of people, I think, use pricing, but they use it for the wrong reasons. So let me start with one of the reasons I've been given for why pricing is better than DCF. So I'm an analyst. I tell you that I never use DCF. I use pricing because I don't have to make assumptions. I mean, let's face it, DCF, you got to make lots of assumptions about cash flows and growth and risk. I think it's far simpler to just use a multiple. P, EV to EBITDA, whatever multi, EV to sales. Is it true that pricing requires fewer assumptions than DCF? Neil, what do you think? Um, I think it does, because if you look at EV to, EV to EBITDA or relative valuation or pricing, uh, you are looking at a similar company. Uh, the no, let me pause right constant. there. With similar, in, similar in what sense? Uh, in the segment that they play in. So if it's uh, uh, if it's a tech company, you're looking at another tech company. If it's a software tech, you can you can find another similar company in, in the same. But implicitly, what are you then assuming about all tech companies? They're all risky. Or have growth, or you see what I'm saying? The difference is not that you're not making assumptions, but the assumptions are implicit rather than explicit. Because when I tell you this company is just like these others, I'm telling you not just based on the sector, I'm saying they have similar cash flow, similar growth, similar risk. Could that be true? Perhaps. But you can see the dangers of pricing, right? If I'm not careful, I'm going to end up thinking something is cheap, not because it's cheap, but because I haven't controlled for those differences. One of the things we're going to talk about today is actually making those implicit assumptions explicit so you can see what you're assuming. Now let me ask you a statistical follow-up question. So with, with any of these pricing multiples, you're comparing across companies. And as I mentioned, the start of pricing, statistics becomes front and center. So let's say I've computed the PE ratios of PE ratios for every company in the market and I put it up in a distribution as I will today. Can the PE ratios of companies be normally distributed? Naeem, what do you think? And if I graph out the PE ratios for companies, can the distribution ever be normal? I don't think so. Uh, okay, perfect. let's say, let's take the don't think so. Let's make it actually more, more, more firm than that. If you look at a normal distribution, you look at the tails of the distribution, what are, the, what are the limits on a normal distribution? What's one tail and the other tail? If I look at the numbers, what's the end, end game on either tail? Normal distribution. So 0.25%, uh, sorry, so 2.5% of the extreme ends uh, of- Fall within uh, 99%. But if you keep looking at the tails, the tails keep going and going and going forever, right? The essence of a normal right. distribution, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. You know, there's very little, but there, can a PE rate, what's the lowest value PE ratio could take? Have you, ever uh, seen a have you ever seen a negative PE ratio? I haven't. No. In fact, if the earnings are negative, what do you get as a PE ratio? Not available, not meaningful. The PE ratio is floored at zero, right? To ask you what the highest yep. value of PE ratio could take, it can be 50,000. You say, no way, it can a P ratio can never have a symmetric distribution. This sounds like inside statistics, right? It's like, who the heck cares? You know what I was told in my first statistics class? If you have a, 
asymmetric or a skewed distribution, I was told never to trust the average. You know why? If all your outliers are big positive numbers and you don't have offsetting outliers on the other side, the average is always going to get pushed out in whichever direction the outliers are. Think of how many pricing stories you've heard where somebody says, this stock is cheap because it's trading at 12 times earnings and the average PE for the sector is 20. That's, that's the entire sales pitch. Therefore, it's cheap. Not only are you making all of the assumptions that Neil and I were talking about, about growth and cash flow, that these other companies are similar, but here's the problem. If you have one company in your peer group with a 500 PE, the average is going to get pulled out. You remember what you were told in statistics when you have an asymmetric distribution, I was told never trust the average. I was told that I could use something else that's more indicative of my distribution. Let's see if any of you got the same advice I got. If you have a skewed distribution or an asymmetric distribution, the average is getting screwed up. What's a more meaningful number to latch on to? Do you want one number to capture what the distribution looks like? Jonathan, do you remember? Instead of the average, what could you use instead? Not affected by outliers. Uh, the median? The median, exactly the same reason. When we do bottom up is we focus on the median. The outliers no longer, they're all more complicated things. You can do the mode and the harmonic mean. Let's not even go there. Just do the median. It's a much more meaningful number. So that's what we're going to talk about today is controlling for differences. In fact, I'm going to start this process off today. by by going back to where I left you on, I left you with the starting process for using pricing. I said to use pricing, you need to have a multiple. At the risk of boring you to death, because I know what a multiple is, let's cut it to basics. Anytime you see a multiple, there'll be a numerator and a denominator. Hang in there. This is not rocket science. You're saying, I know that already. The numerator should be some kind of a market number. Like what? It can be the market value of equity, which is market cap. It can be the market value of equity plus the market value of debt. Though so you might cheat and use book value of debt, which is the market value of the firm. Or it can be market value of equity plus debt minus cash, which is enterprise value. Numerator should always be a market number. It's what you pay. The denominator is where you see the big differences, right? I can divide that market number by revenues. Why am I dividing by revenues? Because I'm desperate. If everything else is negative, you're a money losing company, the only number you have is revenues, I'm gonna divide the market value by revenues. You say, what if I'm a pre-revenue company? I get even more desperate. I divide by number of subscribers, number of downloads, number of website visitors. Number of cars in the parking lot. You think that's absurd? Hey, nothing is absurd. If I can show it works, it works. So it can be a revenue or a revenue driver. If you have a more mature company, it could be earnings. The earnings can either be earnings to equity investors, net income, or it can be earnings to all, to all investors, operating income, but it can be some kind of an earnings number. It can be a cash flow. With equity investors, that cash flow can be either free cash flow equity if you want to get pseudo sophisticated and do what you did in DCF. Or if you're doing pricing because you want to do something quickly, you can say, look, I don't have the time to do CapEx and working capital. I'll take net income plus depreciation, kind of a rough measure of cash flow equity. If you want to get to cash flows to the firm, you take operating income and add back depreciation, amortization, EBITDA, rough measure of operating cash flows. Or again, if you want to get pseudo sophisticated, you can use free cash flow to the firm. Revenues, earnings, cash flows. We can say, look, accountants have already done a job estimating value. Why don't I scale market value to accounting value, book value? That book value can be book value of just equity, shareholders equity, or it can be book value of equity plus book value of debt, which is the book value of the entire firm, or book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. If that sounds familiar, that's the invested capital we use to get to return invested capital. Numerators and equity value, denominators scaling variable. Every multiple you run into, the first step is to break it down. What's in the numerator? What's in the denominator? 
because I'm going to take you through a four-step process for deconstructing multiples that you're going to get incredibly bored with me doing because I'll do it on every multiple I run into. I'm going to start by defining the multiple. And I'm going to pass the multiple through a couple of very simple tests to make sure that the multiple is not screwed up. Because you start with a screwed up multiple, your results are going to be screwed up as well. I'm going to ask, is it consistently defined? Is it uniformly estimated? That's going to be my first stop. My second stop is I'm going to play money ball. I'm going to look at the data. If I tell you something is high, if I say the PE ratio is high, that's a data statement. It's not a theory statement. I've got to show you why it's high. What does the rest of the data look like? I'm going to call that describe the multiple. It sounds fancy, but I'm going to show you histograms. Is this a high number? Is there, you pass your own judgment. Let the data tell you. The third step in the process, I'm going to do some algebra. Trust me, it's very simple. It's like sixth grade algebra, so nothing sophisticated. But I'm going to go back to a discounted cash flow model and use it to come up with the variables that I need to worry about. And I use PE, EV to EBITDA, EV to sales. And I'm going to argue that the implicit assumptions that Neil was talking about, let's at least be explicit about it. Let's see if those assumptions hold up. And only then am I going to apply the multiple. Define, describe, analyze, apply. In my view, people are in such a hurry to apply multiples. And I include a lot of equity research analysts who use these multiples on a daily basis that they don't stop and ask the first three questions. So let's start with the definitional test. The minute you look at a multiple, I don't care what it is, the first question you have to ask is, is this multiple consistently defined? Let me explain. Remember I said every multiple is a numerator and a denominator? Here's the very simple consistency rule. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator has to be an equity value as well. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. I know it sounds incredibly abstract, but let me throw a few multiples at you and you tell me whether they passed the test. Let's start with PE ratios. You've all seen PE ratios, right? You go to any site, you see PE ratio. What's in the numerator? Equity value, firm value, or enterprise value? You'll see, what do you think? What's in the numerator, PE ratios? Equity, firm, or enterprise? Equity. Equity value. And earnings per share is Same. net income divided, isn't it? So thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world passes the test. PE ratios are consistent. Brian, help me out an EV to EBITDA. What's in the numerator? Total enterprise value. Market value of the operating assets, right? That's what enterprise value supposedly measures. And in the denominator of EBITDA, which is a rough measure of operating cash flow, so EV to EBITDA is okay. What about price to EBITDA? The analysts who invented this multiple should be tarred, feathered, and driven out of the fraternity. It is a horrifically bad multiple. Remember I said I collected 550 equity research reports a few, two decades ago? Seven used price to EBITDA to pick companies. One of them happened to be somebody who'd taken this class about six years earlier. So I called him. And he said, who is this? And I said, remember that valuation class you took six years ago? He said, Vaguely, I said, it shows. I said, what the heck are you doing? Dividing market cap by EBITDA? It's not consistent. And he said, no, no, I'm being consistent. I said, what do you mean you're being consistent? He said, I use price to EBITDA for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, that's a very weird definition of consistency. And I said, have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt keep looking cheap to you? He said, yes, yes, I've been seeing that. I said, have you ever stopped and thought about why that might be happening? Do you see why using price to EBITDA is going to lead you to find highly levered companies to be cheap? Because what's in the numerator? Market cap. If I go out and borrow 50 billion and buy back stock, guess what happens to my market cap? It drops at roughly 50 billion, right? I've reduced the number of shares. So there's less market cap. My EBITDA is my EBITDA. No matter how much I borrow right now, you know, it's going to stay what it is. The more highly levered you become, the cheaper you're going to look. It's not that you're cheaper, you're looking cheaper because I'm being inconsistent. Now, before you feel too superior to this guy, if you use price to sales, 
you're guilty of the same sin, right? The numerator is market cap, which is equity value. Your denominator is revenues, which don't belong to just equity investors, they belong to the firm. This is a very simple fix. If you're going to use a revenue multiple, what should be in the numerator always? Brian said market value, the operating asset, enterprise value is a market. It should always be EV to sales, never price to sales. You saying, but my company, you know why people end, you know, get away with using price to sales? There are two sectors where you see price to sales used a lot. One is technology companies. Why do analysts think they can get away with using price to sales with technology companies? Because most of them have very little debt. By accident, you got away with it, not because you did something right. The other used to be retail companies because almost every retail company had roughly the same amount of debt. They all leased their stores, they all borrowed money. Those assumptions have broken down. Yossi? Perhaps that analyst made that um, sort of uh, multiple because, uh, because there were no earnings or perhaps there were negative earnings. So That's fine. you could still use EV, right? There's nothing that stopped. Right. I'm not, I don't have a problem with EBITDA. I just have a problem with matching price to EBITDA. I don't have a problem with revenues. I can understand why you use revenues for young money losing companies. But if you're going to use revenues, you got to use enterprise value, which for these companies might be just netting out cash, right? Because many of them have cash, they don't have debt. You still have an enterprise value that's different. So my problem is not with the denominator, it's making sure your numerator and denominator match up to each other. So is it consistently defined? I'm going to use their sub consistency tests that are messier. We'll come to those. Is it uniformly estimated? Why? Because you're taking 15 companies, right? You're comparing PE ratios across the 15 companies. You better make sure earnings per share are computed the same way for all 15 companies. We used to think that if you have the same accounting standards, that earnings are computed the same way. But here's what we've discovered over the last 20 years. You can have the same accounting standards governing 20 companies, but different degrees of fidelity to those standards, conservative and aggressive. They're not even breaking the rules. They're just using the leeway within the rules to be conservative or aggressive. Is it consistently defined? Is it uniformly estimated? Let's try this. Okay? We already decided PE ratios are consistent, everybody seems to know what a PE ratio is. Even Anna Kornikova knew what the PE ratio Remember Anna Kornikova? Probably before your time. But she masqueraded as a tennis player for like a decade. One nothing, but it was in every commercial you could think of. And this was, you know, she's like a Sharapova, like a Maria Sharapova without the talent. This was like 2002 or 2001. I'm watching a Schwab commercial. And Anna Kornikova is in the commercial. And she's playing somebody. In a it must have been an actress because she was actually winning. So in tennis, every two games, you switch sides, right? So the sun's not in your eyes. So they're switching in the middle of a tennis match. I don't know why this would come up. Anna turns to whoever she's playing and she says, P ratio is price divided by earnings per share. And then she proceeded to say something about preferred dividends that went completely over my head. So I turned out the commercial and started thinking, does Anna Kornikova really know what the PE ratio is? We know the numerator is usually the current price. You know why you should always use the current price? There are some people who use moving average prices. I've always had this issue with moving average prices. I've never been able to buy a stock at a moving average price. Try it. Get on Schwab and say, I'd like to buy it at the 50 week moving average. It doesn't work. You either buy it today's price or not. So it's always the current price. But it's the denominator that you get the real variations, right? I can divide price per share by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year. In February of 2020, before we got into the most recent set of annual reports, you know what the most recent fiscal year for many companies was? It was 2019. Price divided by earnings per share in 2019. I can divide price per share divided by earnings per share in the trailing 12 months, which is probably earnings through September of 2020, if you were doing this in February. Very different number, right? Because you had COVID in 2020, it was very different. I could divide price per share by expected earnings per share in the next four quarters, which is forward PE. Or I could divide price per share by expected earnings per share in the year 2029, which is really, really forward PE. You say, why would I do that? Desperation. You're the biotech analyst, every company in your sector is losing money. You know how you deal with it? If PE ratio is your tool of choice, you project out the earnings per share for every company, 
And then you divide the price today by 2029 earnings and said, this stock looks really cheap. It's trading at seven times 2029 earnings. You don't even know what to do with it, but it just looks good. You can divide by earnings per share before extraordinary items, after extraordinary items. Primary, diluted, fully diluted, partially diluted. In fact, a few years ago, I remember I sat down with Cisco, one of the more widely followed stocks in this market and computed, I think 40 different PE ratios at a point in time, depending on how I measured earnings. And I got very different numbers, ranging from a low of 14 to a high of almost 35. You think, so what? Well, I started this class with the issue of bias. If you're an equity research analyst trying to convince me that Cisco is cheap and you have this range of PE ratios you've computed for Cisco, guess which one you keep offering me as your measure of PE? You want to show me Cisco is cheap. You say, it's trading at 14 times earnings, 14 times. You latch on to the low number. And if you're bearish about the same company, you always latch on to the forward number. If you get a chance and you're watching CNBC, and you see two analysts arguing about a stock, and let's say it's a very widely followed stock. Notice that the bullish analyst always uses forward numbers and the bearish analyst always uses trailing numbers. It just, it, it, it I'm sorry, it, it, yeah, the bullish analyst uses forward earnings, make the P ratio look low. The bearish analyst is just, it's, it, you pick whatever multiple best sells your story. That's P E ratio, let's stay on P E ratios. Let's say, let's say you're looking at technology companies. You're comparing the P E ratios. Let's say these are technology companies that have earnings. Already we're going to talk about potential bias because you're going to lose some companies that don't have earnings. But let's say you're focused in on technology companies with earnings, you computer the P E ratio. But they also have options outstanding and varying amounts with varying degrees of in the money or out of the money. And you're trying to figure out a consistent way of measuring PE ratios where you end up with a PE ratio that's not being biased, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you different measures and you tell me what kinds of companies might potentially look cheap because of bias, not because they're cheap. I could divide price by primary earnings per share using the actual shares outstanding. Among these companies then, which ones might look cheap, even though they're really not cheap? Companies with lots of options outstanding or companies with very few options outstanding? Prachi, what do you think? Lots of options. Lots of options because the market cap will reflect the fact they have options. The price per share is good. You know, the market cap will be low. And if I divide by the actual shares, I'm going to think that all these, so that's not going to work. I could divide by fully diluted, right? That's, that should take care of the companies with lots of options outstanding, but here, What's my bias? You have companies with options outstanding. Are they all equivalent? You know, so let's say you have two companies, both have 30% of their shares and options outstanding, but one has options that are deep in the money and one has options that are deep out of the money. If you're dividing price by fully diluted earnings per share, which companies are going to look cheap to you based upon fully diluted earnings per share. They both have the same number of options, same number of overall shares, but one is deep in the money options and one is deep out of the money. Brian, what do you think? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. They, have, they both have the same number of options, right? Yeah, but one is in the money, one is out of the money. Yeah, so you value the in the money ones more. But if we're just dividing by the total number of shares, I think they'd be the same. Well, remember though, market cap reflects what's out there already, right? So if you're looking at the market cap of a company with deep in the money options outstanding, then that market cap is going to be lower because the market says, look, it's lots of options. They're all in the money. They're going to get exercised. So I'm going to lower the market price more. So if I divide the market cap by the number of shares outstanding, the companies which have deep in the money options will have a much lower market cap, higher earnings. The PE ratio is going to look lower for those companies, even though they might not be cheaper. So the best way to deal with this actually is to factor out what will this mean to my market cap? Already you can see that when you're using things like PE ratios and per share numbers, and many PE ratios are based, so for instance, Yahoo Finance computes PE ratios. I have absolutely no idea still what they use in the denominator. 
because they seem to have no single rule that works across companies. And some they use primary, some they use fully diluted, some they use only in the money options. Don't ask me why they do that. Be very careful about all per share numbers. That's my advice. In fact, if you have lots of options outstanding, here's my suggestion. Just take market cap and divide by net income. Okay. Basically what you're doing is you're removing the effect of this per share issue of zero one. Do I count the option or not count the option? You're better off not using per share numbers. This has become less of an issue since 2007 because companies have switched to restricted shares. But pre-2007, this was a huge issue. What do you do about options? Which brings me to EV EVTABITA. I recently saw a graph on what's happened to different pricing multiples in use since the 1960s. In fact, even in the 40 years that I've been in markets, I remember in the mid 80s, the early 80s, when I looked at equity research reports, PE ratios were like 90% of reports. EV EVTABITA would show up at like one in a hundred equity research reports. Today, I think a third of all equity research for non-financial service companies, maybe more, uses EV debita. It's become this hugely popular multiple. We'll talk about why that might be good and bad reasons, but people use it all the time. And so once in a while, when I run into an analyst who uses EV debita, I ask them a question because I want to see how seriously they've thought through whether the multiple is consistent. I said, look, in the numerator, you've got market value of equity plus should be market value of debt, but we cheat and use book value of debt. So I'll, I'll cut you that slack minus cash in the denominator of EBITDA. So you ready for the question? Why do we net cash? Or why do we use net debt in the numerator, not equity plus debt? Why do we net cash out of the numerator? D, you want to try? Why do we net cash out of the numerator? I, I just thought that's the definition of the enterprise value. No, that is the definition of enterprise value, but why did we come up with the definition in the first place? Why do we use net debt in the first place? Yossi, you want to try? It's not a core asset, it's an operating asset. Should I be netting out all non-core assets then? Yes. So, so where do I stop? So I, I think at least you're being internally consistent. You're saying if it's not core, I should be netting it out, which means I have a huge, think of how much mechanical challenge I'm going to face, right? With every company, then I've got to go to S&P Capital IQ. I've got to figure out core versus non-core and net it out. And I've never seen anybody do it. So if you're right, we're, we're in serious trouble because nobody's doing enterprise value right. Genjua? Genwa? Because uh, you don't include the interest income from cash in your EBITDA. Bingo, you got it, right? It's a consistency issue because the income from cash is not part of EBITDA. And here Yossi's point comes in. You know what else we should be netting out at the minimum? What else did, when we did DCF, Equity remember we, we, go ahead, we, what, go ahead. Equity what, investment. Equity investments in what? Cross holdings. Cross holdings, right? If you have small investments in other companies, as Yossi pointed out, they're not part of the operating asset. So I, in fact, agree with Yossi's definition. Rather than use the word core, I would use word operating. And the way I would define operating is if the income from the asset is part of my operating income, then I'm going to keep it in the numerator. But if it's not, I'm going to have to eliminate it because it's an inconsistency issue. Remember the Tata Motors valuation I showed you, where 40% of the value come, came from cross holdings and other Tata companies. To compute the EV to EBITDA for Tata Motors, I would need to net out the market value of those holdings from my numerator. saying, what a nightmare. Do you think by going to pricing that you could somehow run away from your problems? Those are problems when we did DCF, they're gonna stay problems when you do pricing. So I'm gonna have to Professor, net out. I have a yeah, question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just saying that during an acquisition or for a particular cross holding, if the income statements are 100% consolidated, now then- we have a different problem, right? Because if you have a 60% holding and I consolidate, we have an entirely different mess. What, you know, the, the point about cross holding was it's a minority cross holding, you should be netting it out. But if you have a majority holding, tell me what the problem is. Lead me through the problem, Prachi. What's in my debt? I've consolidated so holding. EBITDA includes the minority, the value of the minority. 100% of the EBITDA. Of the EBITDA. 
The debt includes 100% of the debt. The cash includes 100% of the cash. What's the only item that won't include 100%? The market uh, value, but the markets are pretty? not stupid. They're not going to consolidate. They'll reflect only the 60% you own. So you have a consistency problem again, right? So is there a quick fix? I mean, I'm in a hurry. I want to fix a consistency problem. Is there a way I can bring the 40% I've left of the equity that I've left out into the numerator? Because if I can bring it back in, at least I can do the song and dance of being consistent. What can I add back to the numerator that captures the 40% of the subsidiary that doesn't belong to me? What's in your balance sheet? Is there some item on the balance sheet that captures that 40%? Yeah, the non-controlling interest. It's a non-controlling or minority interest. In fact, when you see EV to EBITDA multiples, careful analysts, you'll often see them add the minority interest in the numerator. You say, what the heck are you doing? They're in a ham-handed way trying to fix the inconsistency. Ham-handed because that minority interest is a book value. If you can, you'd like to convert it into a market value, but you're trying to be consistent. I've seen people use EV to EBITDA with Asian companies and it's a nightmare because of the, the cross holdings that made you crazy when you were a DCF show up in every single EV. And if you're not careful, you're gonna be picking all the wrong companies as cheap because you're not cleaning up for the cross holdings. Which brings me to one final multiple. We're in the middle of a housing boom. I wouldn't say the word bubble because that suggests, you know, you passed a judgment already. So basically, you see, I'm in the neighborhood I live in, prices have gone up like 12% in the last year. And always, this is a question with real estate, is, is this a bubble? Are we going to, is housing becoming too expensive? And one of the ratios that housing analysts use to judge whether you know, housing is getting expensive is they take the price of a house and they divide it by the rental income you can get from that house if you rented it out, that ratio. So when that ratio becomes too high, their argument is stocks have become overpriced or houses have become overpriced. Which is legitimate, right? You compare it across time. But let's say you're an investor, you're trying to decide whether to put your money in real estate or whether to put it in stocks. So let's say you come into a $250,000 windfall right now. You can either buy an apartment with the 250,000 or invest in stocks. You're saying which one, they both look expensive, which one's more expensive? And my question is a simple comparison question, which is the consistency issue. If I'm looking at the housing price to annual rental income, net rental, because you have some expenses with that. So if I'm looking at housing price to annual net rental income, which multiple for stocks would be the most legitimate comparison as a direct comparison? Is it price earnings? Is it EV to sales? Is it EV to EBITDA or EV to EBIT? Housing price to net rental income. This is like one of those games you play as a kid, which you know, which one is the closest. So basically if I want to make a direct comparison. Can I compare to the PE ratio? Nathan, why not? Uh, because the rental income, I imagine you buy it on a mortgage. So it seems like there's mm -hmm. the debt value and the equity value exactly. uh, on the top of that. And I'm not subtracting out the interest expense from the denominator. So that's actually not my true income. It's rental income minus it. So it is more of an enterprise. So basically, so we'll take the PE out of the mix. So now it gets a choice of, is it more like EV to sales, EV to EBITDA, EV to EBIT? That's kind I'm of a tough go, call out. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say EV to EBIT. I, that's what I would pick too, right? Because, why? Because it's not like I'm adding the depreciation back to rental income. I could do that if I wanted to. If you're interested, there are actually papers that compare PE, you know, but they do the wrong thing. They compare PE ratios to housing prices to rental income. I'm you know, thinking about creating a data series on my website where I track you know, housing prices to rental income, that ratio to EV to EBIT. At least you get a sense of when is housing getting out of hand? When is, you know, both could be over, overpriced for all we know, on a, but on a relative basis, the comparison holds. So any questions on the descriptor, on the definitional test? So let's move to the descriptive test. As I said, this is playing Moneyball. You know, you've all seen the movie. You know, is it Brad Pitt? 
Is in the movie. Who played? Uh, this is like, it's, a, it's one of the great movies of all time. If you haven't seen it, or read the book, if, if you prefer. And both, they're both great. And of course, it's the story of the Oakland A's. And Billy Bean. Billy Bean was one of the youngest general managers when he became general manager of the Oakland A's. And when he became the general manager, he did what general managers elsewhere in baseball did, which is be driven by the traditions of baseball. Traditions of baseball is you had these scouts who went out and looked at players and they frankly made up crap about, you know, this is what works. You know, a guy has a crooked arm. He's going to be the next Sandy Koufax. If his arm is straight. And they came and told you things and you signed people for millions of dollars based on these scouts advice. And believe me, notice that the scouts seem to have absolutely no predictive power. He said, why the heck are we listening to these old guys tell us who to sign? Why don't we let the data tell us? Baseball is a game with which is built around data, right? Every single pitch is chronicled, every single walk. So he said, we have the data. Why do we need a scout to tell us that somebody can get on base when we can see who gets on base? So he hired math and statistics PhDs to go through the data to decide who to sign, who to let go, how to build a team. Now, incidentally, the Oakland A's, did not win the World Series with his methods, but with this minimal budget, they were able to build up this team that was a contender year after year. So Michael Lowes wrote about him. So basically his point was, why are we letting rules of thumb and this anecdotal evidence drive our choices when in fact we have the data? You think we have a similar problem in stocks? Think of how many rules of thumb that are floating around. Based on what old scouts from the no, forget about the 50s and the 60s, from way back a century ago saying a stock that trades at less than 10 times earnings is cheap, a peg ratio less than one is cheap, a trip, basically all these rules. And he said, why are we letting uh, you know, these rules drive us when we have the data? It's, in the 1960s, if you had rules of thumb, I could understand. You had, you had no access to databases, you couldn't do it by hand. So you had to come up with rules of thumb that made your life simpler. We now have the data. You have S&P capital like you, you can get the PE ratio for every publicly traded company in the world in five minutes into a big Excel spreadsheet. You want to tell me what's cheaper expensive? Just look at the damn data. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play some money ball with the data. And along the way, we're going to deal with some statistical artifacts with multiples that we have to take into account when we, when we use multiples. So the start of every year, for instance, I compute the PE ratio, EV debit, price, to every single conceivable multiple for every company that's publicly traded, all 46,000. I compute it. As opposed to what? Capital IQ also gives multiples directly, right? You can look up the PE ratio, you look up the EV. I never use them, not because, you know, I don't think capital IQ is competent, but remember we talked about the variance and definitions. What exactly are you using? This way I control what goes in the multiple. And since we have the raw data, why would you ever want to trust somebody to tell you what the PE ratio is or the EV debita? So when I compute EV debita, I take market value of equity and I do debt and I subtract out cash, I subtract out minority investments in other companies and then I add my estimated market. So basically I try to do it what I, the way I think it should be done. And even if I'm wrong, at least I know what goes in the numerator and denominator. So I have 46,000 companies that do this. And, and for the last 30 years, at least with US companies, the start of every year, I put up these distributions, histograms. Remember histograms and statistics, nothing fancy. I just count the number of companies with PE ratio zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12, 12 to 16, and I put it into a distribution. Here's my histogram for PE ratios for US companies at the start of 2021. And I'm reporting three different PE ratios, trailing PE, I'm sorry, current P, which at the start of 2021 would be based upon 2019 earnings, right? Because of 2020 numbers hadn't come out of your calendar year end. Trailing P, which for most of these companies is September of 2019 through September of 2020. Hold on to that thought because that means the worst of COVID is in the trailing 12 month numbers. And then I have forward P, which in the start of 2021 is the, for the next 12 months. So all three. Notice with every one of these distributions, even though the numbers might be different, they share a common feature. There's a peak to the left and a tail to the right. 
And we talked about why, right? The lowest number I can get for a P. Okay. So the P-E ratio cannot be less than zero, the P-E ratio on the other extreme. So in fact, I've arbitrarily capped it at 100. Otherwise, the tail would keep stretching up. This is what the distribution for almost every multiple look like. Peak to the left, tail to the right. It's the nature of pricing. You're saying, so what? When I compute the descriptive statistics, it shows up. In fact, if I take the car and P, the average P that I got for US companies was 110. It's terrifying, right? 110 times earnings. But before you get too terrified, the median is 18. That's high, but it's definitely not 110. Saying what happened? The lowest PE is close to zero. The highest PE at the start of 2021 was 36,157. You think that must be one highly priced stock? It was actually trading at about $8 per share, but the earnings per share were a fraction of a cent. Next time somebody uses an average on you, stop them. Because people use this average, you know, it's company cheap, it's less than the average. It's basic statistics. Don't use the average with pricing. It's just way too skewed by those outliers. But here's an interesting thing that I want you to focus on. There were 7,584 US companies on Capital IQ. But when I did my current P, only 2,780 showed up. So what's true about the remaining 4,700? What, what, what has to be true about them that they've dropped out of my sample? They all have a price, obviously, because they're publicly traded. But they're money losing companies. Two thirds of all companies I've lost from my sample because they're money losing. You think that's okay, you still have 2007. You're right, I still have a big sample, but my sample is biased. Remember in statistics, we make a big deal about bias. You see where the bias comes from? What types of companies have I removed from my sample? Young companies, money losing companies, distressed companies, they're all out of my sample. And if I go from current PE to trailing PE, I lose another 300. That's 2020 playing its magic, right? Because you have COVID, you have more companies losing money. As I go from trailing PE to forward PE, I lose another 127. Why do you think that is? Why do I lose more companies as I go to forward PE? What do I need for forward PE? I need expected earnings in the next four quarters, right? And who expects earnings? I can't be sitting down forecasted expected earnings for 7,000 something firms. So I go to Capital IQ and say, what's the analyst estimate for earnings for the next four quarters? And guess what happens? If you're a company not tracked by analysts, there are we introduce bias in very subtle ways. When we choose a multiple in how we compute the multiple, we need to be aware of what companies are being removed. So when you lose companies in your sample, even if you have a big sample, track the companies you lose and see if they have something in common because you might be introducing bias into your comparisons without even thinking about it. Now until about 20 years ago, I used to do this just for US companies because that's all the data I had. I didn't have access to capital IQ or facts that I just US companies. I used to get them from Value Lab. Then I'd show up in Mumbai or Sao Paulo and I'd show this graph. Peak to the left, tail to the right. And this old grizzled analyst would put up his hand and was 60 years old and say, it doesn't look anything like that in Mumbai. So how do you know? It's a gut feeling. And after about 10 or 15 times of hearing gut feeling, I said, you know what? I don't trust your gut feeling. So starting about 20 years ago, I started doing this for all companies globally. And this graph actually is a graph that I've repeated probably for the last 15 years. And what I've done in this graph is taken all global companies and put them all in the same graph, broken down by region. So basically you see with every part of the world, peak is to the left, tail is to the right. This is universal. In every part of the world, you're going to get this mean median divergence. But the nice thing about this graph, if you look, focus in on the PE ratios, it's clear there are differences around the world. Take a look at the median value, because I've given you the distributional concerns. And again, I'm keeping to my own advice. Don't report, I could have reported the average, but who the average is kind of meaningless. Focus on the median. The cheapest part of the world, 
to invest in in terms of trailing PE ratios is I think Eastern Europe and Russia. Now, do you see the danger of just putting your money in the lowest PE ratio stocks? If I go globally and pick the lowest PE ratio stocks, I'm gonna end up with a lot of Eastern Europe and Russian stocks. They will look cheap on a PE ratio basis, but they might just be much riskier. This median is much, much higher than it was a year ago. You know why? Because it's trailing 12 months. It reflects the effects of COVID. You're gonna see PE ratios go up because earnings are collapsing. And if you look at the percentage of companies with the PE ratio is greater than zero, you can see in every part of the world, I'm losing 40, 45. In fact, I lose the most companies from my sample in the US. I think I lose almost 68% of my sample because I'm money losing. So if you look at the last column, these are personal companies PE greater than zero, which means the remaining companies are money losing companies. It's pure data analysis. I'm not making any theoretical statements. I'm saying this is what it is. And sometimes the differences can be revealing, not about pricing, but about underlying differences across markets. In January 2013, for instance, I looked at the price to book ratios because I do this for every multiple across markets. And you can see the outlier, right? Japanese stocks were trading at a price to book ratio of 0.67. But Japanese stocks also had the largest cash holdings of any group of companies in 2013. You're saying, so what? Market cap includes cash. And if you have a lot of cash, you're going to see this statistic start to pop up, which is you know, your median price to book. So there you can see the differences across markets. And again, I'm not saying put all your money in Japanese stocks, they're cheap, but give you at least a sense of why there are differences and start asking follow-up questions. And finally, I hate rules of thumb. Now, I remember sitting on a panel with a group of private equity and LBO analysts. Uh, you know, these were people actually not analysts, but people who ran the firms. This was about 12, 15 years ago. And we were talking about LBOs. And I, I talked about the fact that very few LBOs did, did, did the company seem to do a deep dive into the cash flows and do, I didn't even talk about discounted cash flow valuation. I said, you know, they don't seem to explore whether the companies are truly cheap before they jump into that. And one of the heads of one of the LBO firms, you know, jumped in and he said, well, it's easy to tell when something is cheap. I said, really? He said, oh, anything that trades at less than six times ever die is cheap. I said, well, oh, that's amazing that you have this rule of thumb that seems to work so well. So ever since I've actually done a very simple exercise, every year I look at the percentage of companies that trade at less than six times EBITDA. And in 2010, I actually sent this graph to him and I said, still using six times EBITDA? Because in 2010, half of all US companies traded at less than six times EBITDA. What sense is that cheap? Half the market looks cheap to you. It's true, six times EBITDA would have worked in 2021, unless you happen to be in Japan or Russia. Do you see where I'm going? Why are we so attached to absolute rules? When we have all of the data, you know what a simple measure of cheap is? Take the 25th percentile. There'll be different numbers in different markets and across time. This way you're letting the data tell you what's cheap or expensive rather than have this absolute rule of thumb. Define, describe. Any questions about this? I, I find it funny because we live in the age of big data and crowd wisdom, right? Everything's about big data and how the crowd's right. You know who has the longest experience with big data and crowd wisdom? Financial markets have always been about big data and crowd wisdom. That market price is the crowd set price. And in finance, we've learned to have a healthy recognition that crowds are not always right. In fact, the whole area of behavioral finance is built on the presumption that crowds can be wrong. Why? Because we bring in psychological biases into the game. Moneyball, which is looking at the data and letting it tell us what's cheap and what's expensive. Now let's talk about what drives multiples. So when you look at a multiple, two questions you almost always want to try to get the answer for. One is what are the fundamentals that drive this multiple? PE, price to book, EV to sales, whatever the multiple, what are the variables that I should be controlling for? 
And second, you need to get a sense of how, as those variables change, your multiple will change. Let me give you a preview. If you're using PE ratios, I'm gonna argue there are only three variables you need to control for. Payout ratio, cost of equity, expected growth rate. And I'll tell you how I came up with those three in a minute. But those are the three variables. So you're comparing 20 companies and PE ratios, make sure you look at those three variables. I can even tell you which direction those variables are gonna affect the PE ratios. Growth increases, PE ratios will go up, holding all else constant. As payout ratio goes up, PE ratio will go up, holding all else constant. As cost of equity goes up, holding all its constant, the PE ratio will decrease. I can tell you what variables drive the multiple and how changes in those variables affect the multiple. Sounds magical, but it's actually coming from a very simple route. I go back to my intrinsic valuation routes. I'm an intrinsic valuation person, person at art. So if you ask me what drives the PE ratio, it's an equity multiple. I go back to the simplest equity valuation model that I can think of, a dividend discount model, right? Make it a stable growth dividend discount model if need be. And then I do some very basic algebra. I divide both sides of that dividend discount model with whatever my denominator, my multiple is, earnings per share, book value. And if I do that, I will end up with an intrinsic value equation for my multiple. I never use this equation actually back in because I'm just using a stable group, but it tells me what variables drive the multiple. That's with an equity multiple. With an enterprise value multiple, I go back to an enterprise value, discounted cash flow model, free cash flow of the firm divided by cost of capital minus growth rate, stable growth model, and divide both sides by revenues or EBITDA, whatever. And I will, so whatever multiple you throw at me, I should, with about five minutes of algebra, be able to tell you, these are the variables you should be careful about. So I'll show you how I came up to my conclusions about PE ratios. PE ratio equity multiple, I go, went back to a stable growth dividend discount model. So that's a Gordon growth model, expected dividend divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate. Right? Remember in math, if you have an equation, you can divide both sides by a constant and it still stays an equation. I divided both sides of this equation by earnings per share. So price divided by earnings per share is PE. Dividends divided by earnings per share is payout ratio. And because I want next year's dividend, there's a one plus Z. There you go. In an intrinsic value world for a stable growth dividend paying firm, the PE ratio should be a function of payout ratio, cost of equity, growth rate. Saying, what if I don't trust my company to pay out what it can afford in dividends? Easy, replace dividends with free cash flow equity. You get a free cash flow equity payout ratio, growth and cost of equity. And that drives the PE ratio for a company. Again, you're not plugging numbers into this because if you did plug your numbers or numbers for your company into this equation, what you're going to get is a PE ratio based on a stable growth. Remember, you've already done a full-fledged intrinsic valuation. The purpose of these equations is to look at what drives the model. That's a stable growth model. You say, what if I have a high growth company? You know what? I can do a two-stage discount of cash flow model. I know this equation looks incredibly complex, but it's actually just a present value equation. I give you a high growth company and use a dividend discount model to value a high growth company. You know what the process is, right? You project dividends during the high growth phase and you project a terminal value. You know what this first term is? It's a present value of a growing annuity. I've taken the dividends for the next 10 years, growing at 20% a year, taking the present value of those dividends. That takes care of so think of it in terms of a spreadsheet. I've taken the dividends for the next 10 years. The first term in the equation captures the present value of those dividends in one step. The second term in the equation is basically my terminal value discounted back 10 years. So it's exactly what I do in a DCF captured as a math equation. I remember the first edition of my valuation book was uh, reviewed in Barron's. And um, the guy who reviewed it said, and I like the book, but it's full of obscure mathematical equations. And he was talking about this equation. No, we're in serious trouble when present value equations have become obscure mathematical equations, but this is exactly what we wrought when we put that PV function on your calculator. I'll wait till most of you don't remember the present value of an annuity equation, right? Who needs to? You got the payment function, the end function, the R function, your present value. But there is an advantage in keeping things in full form. In fact, if this is the mathematical equation for a price and you divide by, P, by earnings per share, I get the PE ratio for a high growth firm. And guess what it's a function of? Growth, payout, 
cost of equity. That's an incredibly useful insight. It means I could have a 20 stage growth firm and the variables don't change, but how many times you got to estimate them will change. So I can use these same three variables to compare high growth firms, mature firms. The key that I get out of this, the variables to control for. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use that equation to kind of do some first level statics on what happens when I change things. So let's assume I come to you with a growth firm. It's a completely hypothetical firm. So I've created variables that are easy to work with. For the next five years, I'm going to assume a 25% growth for the firm and in stable growth, an 8% growth rate forever. With payout ratio, it's 20% for the first, for first five years. Why? Because if I want to grow fast, I've got to reinvest more. So I'm reinvesting 80%. But after year five, because I'm a stable growth firm, that's going to drop to 50%. I'm sorry, the payout ratio is going to increase to 50%. So there's lower growth and higher payout. That's for the purpose of analysis, keep the beta at one. It's an average risk firm. And let's say the risk free rate is 6%. So if I first step, I compute a cost of equity 11.5%. I have everything I need. So if you go back to the previous page, I have this equation on, on the PE ratio. I plug in the 20% payout ratio, the 25% growth and the 11.5% cost of equity. That's a high growth phase. The 50% payout ratio, the 11.5% cost of equity, the 8% growth rate in the stable growth phase. I get a predicted PE for this firm of 28.75. I'm gonna call this my intrinsic PE. You know why I call it an intrinsic PE? <coughs> I'm just using a two-stage dividend discount model to value the company. In fact, if you take the DCF that you sent me, where you gave me value per share, you could add three more columns below it and divide your value per share by earnings per share, which would give you an intrinsic PE for your company because you're basing it on your intrinsic value. My intrinsic PE is 28.75. If I pay 28.75 times earnings for this company, I am paying a fair value for the company given its high growth rate for the next five years. So let's say that I give you this calculation and you trust me, you buy the stock at 28.75 times earnings. Why are you paying 28.75? It's a high growth company. What's your nightmare scenario when you pay a high PE ratio for a high growth company? That tomorrow you will wake up and growth for whatever reason is different from what he expected. Every investor goes through this, right? Let's take the negative surprise first. If tomorrow you woke up and your growth rate were 20, so just the first five years, instead of 25% growth, if you had 20, 15, 10, or five, guess what happens to the PE ratio? It drops off. If it gets to be third, if you get positive surprises, which is what you, you know, PE ratio will be higher. You're saying, why are there four columns? I've looked at four interest rate scenarios. From at that point in time, when I did this graph, 4% sounded to me like a really low T-bond rate. Imagine today there'd be a 2% T-bond rate, maybe even a 1% T-bond rate. The lower my risk-free rate, the greater the effect of growth surprises on my P-E ratio. Let me back up again. When you buy a high growth company, what's the form that you get the surprise in. What is it that makes you wake up and say, oh my God, I overestimated growth. What's the, what's, the, what's the announcement that kind of exposes you to that surprise? What did Tesla announce on Friday? They announced earnings and they said, we sold 181,000 cars, the full earnings are not out. It is a surprise today, Tesla is up. Why? Because people think that's higher growth than they anticipated. An earnings announcement is usually the form of surprise. So if your earnings announcement comes in better than expected, that means you reassess your growth rate and push up your growth rate. If it's less than expected. You know what this graph is saying? The effect of any given earnings announcement, the kind of surprise. So for any given surprise, the effect is going to be much greater when interest rates are low than when interest rates are high. Why is that? Why would low interest rate make a given earnings announcement have a much bigger impact on your stock price in either direction at low rates and at high rates. Anybody want to try? Because you know, this I think is it, it would be, a, because we live in a world with low interest rates. This, this could be a very interesting phenomenon to see play out. Why would low interest rates make earnings surprises so much more, you know, in terms of effect on markets so much greater? <laughs> 
Hakan, you want to try? Uh, Let me help you along. Let's make interest rates really, really high. Let's make them, let's make a process in Brazil in 1991. Interest rates are 5,000%. Are you a growth company? What's the value of growth when interest rates are 5,000%? Low. Or non-existent, right? You're saying, give me the money now. Everything's kind of useless. So if I surprise you with higher growth, what's your reaction going to be? I wasn't pricing it anyway, go away. When interest rates are really high, the value of growth, in fact, pretty much disappears. So surprises about growth have very low impact. When interest rates are low, if it's the same company, the value of growth becomes a much bigger percentage of your current value. Surprises about growth, therefore, have a much bigger impact on what happens to your stock price when interest rates are low. So when you see stocks kind of jump around on earnings announcement, in, in, in the market we're in. One reason for it is not that people have become more irrational, but because low rates magnify the effect of almost every surprise at these companies. Any questions on? Uh, Professor, I'm not very clear on the relation between growth and interest rate. What's the value of growth? First, when, when do you get the payoff from growth? It's way out in the future, right? Your cash flows are in your five, six, seven, eight. To get growth, you give up cash flows now to get much higher cash flows in the future. Right. Holding all its constant, if I raise interest rates, what happens to my value of growth? Mm. It's a present value effect, right? Think of the time value mm. of money. It's a pure time value effect. Is, and that's why I took the extreme example of interest rates become 5,000%. Mm. Nobody cares about growth anymore. You're not getting paid for growth. It's all in the future. Everything in the future is getting discounted so much. You're saying, I don't care. So if you start from there and start moving down, you can see why as interest rates come down, growth starts to play a much bigger role at every company. But obviously, if you're a high growth company, it has an even bigger role. Okay. Second, what if I ran was on the beta. Remember, I used a beta of one. So I looked at beta as a 1.75, 0.5. Not surprisingly, as my beta gets smaller, my PE ratios get higher. For the same given growth rate, I'll pay a much higher PE ratio if risk is low than if risk is high. But again, I've looked at four different growth scenarios for the first five years, from 8% to 25%. So I'm gonna ask you kind of a what if question. Let's say you're the CEO of a really high growth. Let's, so let, let me give you a 20% growth rate and a beta of two, you're a risky high growth company. So right now you're at 20% growth, P ratio and, um, and two beta of two, you're trading at about eight times earnings. You're disappointed. You want to trade at a much higher multiple. And I map out two pass possible pathways for you to get to a higher P ratio. One is you can go for more growth, right? Staying with a high risk, in which case you're kind of stuck in this last section because the risk is so high that even as you're going for growth, the effect is very small. What's the other thing you can do? Not go for more growth, but try to make your company less risky. If you do that, you're moving across the graph from high beta to low beta. There's a point in every growth firm's trajectory where a good CEO recognizes that reducing risk has a much bigger payoff than going for that extra 1% of growth. Most growth firms, they don't seem to realize that they think it's growth, more growth, still more growth. They're trying to get blood out of a stone when in fact, if they turn their attention and said, look, we're growing fast enough. Let's see if we can make our business model more secure, more stable. The payoff is going to be much greater. You know, I, for me, I'm, the turning point for me on Amazon, going from being just a good company to a great company is what they did in 2001, not what they did in 2099, because in 2001, as the dot-com boom was melting down, Jeff Bezos very early in 2001 raised $2 billion in cash and kept it as cash. And essentially for the next two years, he just kept his head low and said, I'm going to survive because if I survive through the next two years, I'm going to come out stronger at the end of two years than I was going in because all my competition is going to be gone. There are times to grow and times where you've got to focus on keeping your risk under control. 
this graph kind of gives you the trade-off. So you know what, you know as much about PE ratios as I do now, you know what drives them, you know what questions to ask. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play the role of a really stupid analyst and I'm gonna send out by recommendations to you. And I want you to shoot me down, tell me what I'm missing. So this was in March of 2014. I computed the PE ratios for a bunch of markets and the outlier was easy to tell. Russian stocks were trading at less than four times earnings. So I'm a very naive analyst. I say, you know what? Low PE is cheaper than high PE. Therefore, Russian stocks are cheap. Put all your money in Russian stocks. This was an obvious one. What am I missing when I just compare PE ratios here? We, we talked about the variables, right? Cost of equity, you know, payout ratio, growth rate, everything you say, you got to build around. So which of those three variables best explains why Russian stocks traded four times earnings in 2014? Good interest rates. And interest rates are reflecting what? Because interest rates are driven by inflation. So by itself, there's no inflation story I've told. This is right after, right before the, the Ukraine crisis, right? Which is, you know, could see it building in Russia. This was when country risk in Russia had it peak, it almost hit peak point. You see how that plays out? What goes into your cost of equity? There's free rate, beta time. So there's a country risk component in there. Simple explanation, it looks cheap, but Russia is by far the riskiest market in the world in March of 2014. Of course, it's going to look cheap. So let me make this comparison a little richer. June of 2000, 2000 I took a bunch of emerging markets then, and these were true emerging markets then. I got the PE ratios for markets. I also got interest rates, real growth and country risk. Let me start with a question. This is actually a question that's always good to do pricing with. What would a perfect cheap country look like to you? So let me go through the characters and you tell me. So this is a truly cheap country where you wanna put your money. You want the PE ratio to be low, right? Obviously you want a low PE because you're getting into the market cheap. Do you want growth to be high or low? High. Hi, because otherwise you'll explain. So you want, so now you're seeing where I'm going, right? You want low PE, you want high growth. You want low country risk or high country risk? Low. Low country risk because you don't want anything that explains. So you want low PE, high growth, low country risk. And if I can't give you a payout and I gave you return in equity, how well you want a country with high returns in equity. So you want a country with low risk, you know, high growth, great returns in equity and a low P. You say, what chance are you finding something like this? No harm looking. We have the data now where we can compare across these. In this case, there was no obvious cheap country. So here's what I did. I opened up my statistics book. What am I trying to explain? I'm trying to explain differences in PE ratios across these countries and they have different interest rates, growth in GDP, country risk. I ran a regression of PE ratios. So if you look at this page, the PE ratios against these three variables. You can do this in Excel if you want. You have many tabs, stat programs. Basically, it's very straightforward. That's my dependent variable. These are my independent variables. First R squared I got was 73%. So I'm explaining a lot of the variation in PE ratios across countries with these three variables. Let's look at the coefficients. If you look at the coefficient in interest rates, High interest rate countries tend to have lower PE ratios than low interest rate countries. That kind of makes sense. Countries with high real growth in GDP have higher PE ratios than countries with low growth. So basically high growth countries. And that again makes sense. And countries with high country risk have lower PE ratios than countries with low country risk. One of the things about regressions though is you need something quantitative for each. If you look at country risk, that's why I used a numerical country risk score rather than a rating, because ratings, it's tough to convert into a regression. But basically, the coefficients all make sense, which is not always the case. In this case, I was happy the coefficients made sense. But you're saying it's not a statistics class, who cares? What's the question I'm trying to answer? Which of these countries is cheap and which is expensive, right? I now have the regression. If I go back to the previous page and pull up Argentina, 18% interest rates, two and a half percent real growth, country risk of 45. And I plug those numbers into the regression. I'll get a predicted value for Argentina of 13.57. So what does that tell me? Given the growth, 
given the country risk and given interest rates in Argentina, I'd expect price earnings ratio to be 13.57. The actual PE ratio for Argentina was 14. What would I conclude? Argentina looks close to fairly valued. You're saying, but it still looks expensive. It's close enough because there's noise in your regression. So 73% R squared. So there's going to be a range on your prediction. Argentina looks fairly priced. You think that was a waste of time. Well, I'm not done. I do Brazil. 21 times PE ratio. Predicted PE was 18.55. Here the difference is larger. But since this is statistics, how do I tell whether it's large enough? What do I need to do? I can do a standard error, a prediction. I can tell you whether it's... So when you do regressions, this is one of the nice things. You get predictions that tell you whether the prediction is outside the bounds of normal, normal error. Or what. So you can actually come up with a measure of which of these countries is cheap or expensive based on the actual and predicted P ratios. So any of you are interested in global equity allocation, this is what you want to do with the rest of your professional lives is you want to manage money globally and decide which markets are cheap and which are expensive. We now have the data to be able to do this. And you can bring in whatever you want. You can bring in a political risk variable. You can bring in whatever noise component you want and try to explain what causes PE ratios to vary across countries. Any questions on that example? Now let's talk about US stocks because the dance we're dancing right now is are US stocks in a bubble? I mean, today, they, I mean, I think on Friday, the S&P crossed 4,000, Thursday crossed 4,000, today it's up even more. And of course, for the last decade, we've been told, especially by people who are, you know, who are in a particular camp, and I won't name the camp, that stocks are overpriced, stocks are overpriced. And I'm willing to listen, right? Because it's possible stocks are overpriced, but the metric they've used is the PE ratio. And you can see the basis for their argument, right? What they do is they compare the PE ratio to what it used to be historically. And they say, this PE ratio looks too high. So in this case, for instance, I've computed you know, five different PE ratios, four different PE ratios, and I'll explain, um, I'm sorry, three different PE ratios for stocks. And I'll explain what the difference is. One is uh, traditional PE, where I take the market cap divided by net income. That was in start of 2021, that was 27.19. Think of that as a standard P. Well, it's certainly much higher than it used to be historically. But before I go any further, what's a cautionary note there? Why is it going to look higher even if stocks are reasonably priced? Because I'm using the last 12 months of earnings. It's 2020, right? You've had this collapse in earnings. I could normalize the P where I take the last 10 years of earnings so you don't have 2020. And based on the normalized P, I'm still too high. 31 times earnings higher than historical numbers. There's a version of PE called K. I actually have a blog post, I'll send you the link to this post, which is widely used by some people where you take the normalized earnings, you adjust for inflation, you try to kind of do fancy stuff. And guess what, on that measure too, I'm coming up with the same answer, 29 times earnings, much higher. And Robert Schiller won a Nobel Prize for his version of the PE, which goes back to 1871. And you know, so on every measure of PE, where it levels that are much, much higher, and they've been historically. You're saying this settles it, I'm selling all my stocks. Before you do that, there's another PE that I'm gonna compare, not for stocks, but for bonds. You're saying bonds don't have a PE, why not? You're, what you get as a coupon is the earnings, what you pay as the price is the bond price, right? And in fact, if I invert the T-bond rate, I get effectively a PE ratio for T-bonds. Take a look at what it was at the start of 2021. Remember the T-bond rate was 0.93%. If I pay you know, a full price and I get 0.93% inverted, that's 107.53 times earnings. Investing is a game of choices. If all I were looking at the stock market and said, are stocks expensive? Of course they're expensive relative to history. Then I said, should I sell my stocks? My question is, what do you plan to do with all that money? Oh, you're going to buy bonds? Well, guess what? The price earnings ratios for bonds are even higher than they are for stocks. Are you going to buy real estate? Do you really want to show me to show you what the housing price to rental income ratio is? You have to live in the world you're in. In this case, everything is going to look expensive to you because they're all building off a much lower base. 
any judgment on markets based just on the PE ratio is so incredibly flawed right off the top that I wouldn't even give it more than a passing attention. So here's what I did to kind of bring them onto the same metric. I took the P ratio and I inverted it. It's called the earnings yield. Right? Have you seen this? It's the earnings to price ratio. So you can see the, the, red, the orange line is the Schiller. I'm sorry, these are still the P, so I'll come back to that. Earnings to price ratio. And I put it against the T bond rate. So if you see in this graph, the brown line is the earnings to price ratio, the blue is the T bond rate. Now you get something where you can look at the movements over time. And I'm gonna use that, but let me do the previous page because I jumped over it. If you just compare the P, the, what you're getting on stocks to T bonds, I could actually make an argument that stocks are actually cheap now rather than expensive relative to the T bond. Fine, it's interesting because uh, for 12 years now, Schiller has been telling us that stocks are overpriced. Talk, and, the problem is when you keep saying stocks are overpriced and they keep going up, then at some point in time, you run into an issue. And for Schiller, I think that came about towards the end of last year where he decided that this wasn't working. So he very recently modified his PE to bring in the T-bond. So he's basically, did, so this is something I've been doing for the last 10 years. He's now brought in the T-bond PE ratio and said, you know what? Stocks look expensive, but they might actually be cheap. He kind of leads to that. He doesn't draw a conclusion. But by comparing it to the T-bond rate, he's effectively saying you've got to compare what you make on stocks to what you make on T-bonds. You can't just make judgments on the PE ratio standing alone. Yossi? Yes, Professor, but you don't compare international markets, foreign markets. You could, you could basically. And you, see, you get the same phenomenon payout, maybe not to the same extent. European stocks are trading at PE ratios that are historic highs. Indian stocks are trading at P ratios even higher than the US. So maybe there is a market out there that's an outlier market, but the markets that are outlier markets are markets which have country specific problems that are very, very, you know, very dangerous. So this is not just a US, if only US stocks are rising, you're right. I could compare the P ratio for US stocks to European stocks and say, I'm gonna move my money up. But right now, every market, is showing this phenomenon. And I think that's what makes it so difficult is every rule of thumb is based on a very different set of markets. And right now across markets, you're seeing this phenomenon play out. So I'm gonna leave you with one final analysis that I did. So I took that page where I have earnings to price ratios and T-bond rates. I actually added an extra data series for the difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bond rate. You know what that measures? It measures the slope of the yield curve. You're saying, who cares? Well, markets seem to care. At least there is this, this, this conventional wisdom, but that when the yield curve is downward sloping, and some of you might've, might have seen this new story pop up a couple of years ago when the yield curve went briefly downward sloping. The T-bond rate, T-bond rate was actually higher than the T-bond rate. That this was viewed as a death knell for stocks. That somehow downward sloping yield curves will lead to stock returns. I did a post then as well to point out the statistical flaws with that argument. But for, long, for a long time, people have said the level of rates matters and the term structure matters. So here's what I did. I did a correlation between the earnings to price ratio and the T-bond rate. Guess what? They move together a lot at the time. You could see that in the graph, might as well get the confirmation. And it's true, the more upward sloping the yield curve, the lower the earnings to price ratio, which basically means a higher PE ratio. So there is some truth to the fact that upward sloping yield curves are better for higher stock prices than flatter downward sloping yield curves. But I decided to go further. I ran a regression of the earnings. So this is across the 50 years of US data that I have of earnings to price ratio against the T-bond rate and the T-bond rate minus the T-bond rate. But statistics teaches me that before I use the regression, I've got to check for statistical significance. The T-statistics, these are what they're in the brand, is seven for T-bond rate. Clearly T-bond rates matter, but T-bond rates, not so much. In fact, the T-statistic has dropped. In fact, it's, you know, and that's something that's happened primarily in the last 12 years. Until 2008, the slope of the U curve seemed to have a much bigger impact on stock prices since 2008, the slope of the yield curve 
seems to have stopped mattering, which is, I think, an indirect way of saying that the yield curve slope is what the Fed has the biggest impact on because they can make the curve flatter or more upward sloping. And what this regression says, the Fed effect on market through the yield curve has decreased. And this is actually contrary to the conventional wisdom because we are talking about the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. The data actually suggests the Fed has become less effective at driving markets than it was pre-2008. And here's the reason. Once the T-bond rate drops to one and a half or 2%, it's tough to make the yield curve upward sloping, right? I mean, how much upward slope can you get? So basically it reduces the power of central banks when rates get this low. It's one of, and it's one of the great ironies of the last decade is while we blame the Fed for keeping rates low, they've actually made themselves less effective at driving markets. Any questions before we end for the day? So I'm going to stop and I will see you on Wednesday. Take care.